Hello and welcome to the series of interviews with CTSNet. My name is Leanne Harling and I'm here with a familiar face uh, to many cardiac surgeons throughout the UK. Um, someone who with a vast degree of experience, over 40 years in the industry, um, an expert in device development, in heart valves, um, John McKenna. Thank nice. you very much for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you, Leanne. It's nice to be here. I thought perhaps we could start by just talking a little bit about you, your career over the last almost 40 years now, I, I understand. Yes, well, I was, I was very lucky to be at the very beginning of some of the development work in cardiac surgery and devices, especially. I did do some work in perfusion, and if you see how far we've come, from the old rig bags through to hard shells, through to high efficiency bubble deformers, and to flat plate membranes, and now on to hollow fibres. We've moved significantly in that time, in parallel with the perfusionists and in parallel with the cardiac surgeons. But really, um, this has been a symbiotic relationship. The industry, often forgotten, I think, sometimes in the, in the, the annals of the great and the good, um, unknown engineers, men and women, forging a new path with new materials and new devices, often the surgeons, especially the patients never hear of them. And they have done all the work. I'm just the mouthpiece for them out there in the wide world. It's important, I think, that we have a discussion about that and how industry has moved with surgery over, the, over these years. Um, you're right in saying that as, as surgeons, we probably claim all the credit most of the time. And uh, in fact, surgery wouldn't be what it is today without the devices which uh, the industry has provided us. Um, Perhaps maybe talk about the, the key steps. You talked about the development of uh, oxygenators, of, of bypass as we know it today. Um, maybe that's something that we can start by addressing. Yes. Well, well I mean, some basic questions had to be answered. Do, do, you, do you need pulsatile flow or not? And in London, of course, uh, people like Professor Taylor did a lot of work in that. And, and we, we now don't really use pulsatile flow as much as it was intended to be. <clears throat> the oxygenators themselves have, have changed out of all proportion and, and it allows you as a surgeon to do much longer operations safely without all the other problems. We used to have a pump head and various other sequelae that came from microemboli. In parallel, the implantable devices, I feel, have not moved as far as they should have. Uh, when I started in this business, many of the people involved, <coughs> excuse me, many of the people involved were Renaissance men to an, an extent, mainly men, I'm afraid, and they had a polymath idea of what they were going to do in life. And cardiac surgery was, to some, a hobby. Some were wealthy people. Others were people who came from a disadvantaged background, but worked very hard and were obviously very clever. And their idea was always to look at the patient first and create something new for them. And they'd often have an idea in the morning, create something in the afternoon. Uh, I worked with a very clever man called Marion Ionescu who invented the pericardial valve, bovine pericardial valve. And he would change the design. His wife would sew it in the kitchen table overnight and he'd implant it the next morning after dipping it in formaldehyde. And that's where the modern valves came from. But I'd like to highlight that that was nearly 50 years ago. Today we're still using bovine pericardium. I think to an extent the industry has kind of dropped the ball a little bit on that part. The science of materials, biomaterials, has moved on a lot. And we're still using parts of cows. It seems a bit prehistoric. And I think we should be using to biostable polymers. I think we should be looking at a lot more different materials. The problem is the regulatory environment, the legal environment, <coughs> the volume environment, in that the industry, often in paediatrics, will not make a lot of things because there's not enough. There's not enough to make and to get the quality assurance that we would normally have. What are the key barriers that you face? I mean, you've co covered some of it in industry with new device development and 
I'm sure that's changed over the years, as you, you said, in the old days of, of making it on your kitchen table and then implanting it the next day. Uh, we all know you that sadly that it's now. not quite the same anymore. Um, it's very hard to set up trials and there's often a, quite a lot of scepticism of industry, I think, in that maybe pushing something for financial gain rather than, than for the best of the patient. How do you feel that that affects your development? I think there is an element of that. <clears throat> the, the industry is there for profit, of course it is. I think uh, when I was very lucky to start at a time when people were doing it for other reasons, if I remember Lowell Edwards did it because he had made a lot of money, he didn't need to create a new heart valve. Uh, many of the industries we now know today as big corporations started as small almost garage facility type places where, where these people made things to help. And of course, as the big corporations come in, they get further and further removed from the coalface, the guys at the very top. And yes, there's a factor about money, I agree. And that's why the development of product is so geared towards Europe, and so geared towards the United States. Whereas because in the NHS we don't have that. Well, we, we, in the United States, products cost a lot more. Products cost a lot more partly because of product insurance. And remember, as, as patients get older, when I started in this business, the average age of a heart valve patient was somewhere around about 45 mm. because they had rheumatic fever. Now the average patient is somewhere in the 76, 78 range in the first world. And that means you have to insure the product for less. They're not going to last as long. The patient themselves is not going to last as long. So the period of trial of the product has diminished. Whereas before the period the product had to work for was much, much longer. So we've seen a lot more movement towards biological valves and less of mechanical valves. Despite the fact mechanical valves are hemodynamically superior Durability-wise, much superior, but they need anticoagulation. But we have no axe. No one quite knows what's going to happen there, but that could change the whole scene totally. How far away do you think we are from the development of a durable, non-mechanical bioprosthesis, which would mean that we would bridge that gap between mechanical and um, biological valves without anticoagulation? The whole uh, regulatory environment has increased and is increasing exponentially. The amount of oversight is tremendous. The very fast pace we saw at the beginning will not happen anymore. The problem you have is a mechanical valve has to almost last 50 years by definition. A biological valve, I think you only have to report something going wrong if it goes wrong before seven years. So there's a big gap between those two. And especially in the socialised medicine system, the prices are being pushed down. So is there an impetus to move forward with new biomaterials? I believe there should be. I believe the biomaterials could make an analogue human valve. And that's something we could do for many things. But when I go to a business conference, the other side of my work, and I go to a business conference, I sit next to a guy from IT or computers. His product life cycle is three months, six months. Ours is 30 years. We have, we have to move. Part of the reason I think we're not moving is because there's so many laws and so many intercessions between the industry and surgeons. When I started in this business, it was like this. They had an idea we would make it. We would try and develop things, they would assist. Now they, they have to be more apart. We have to have more of a Chinese wall between us, which I think is not good. We, yes, we have medical advisory panels, of course, but there's very, very careful oversight of that. So I think development will slow down also in the past, 
we, and, and it still happens today, we have fashions. Cardiac surgery is no different than any other. I can take you through some. Um, minimally invasive surgery, port to access, uh, TMR, um, myocardial wrapping, Batista operations, um, beating heart surgery. All of these were seen as a panacea and have, in many respects, died away. And we have to stop this big pendulum swing where, where we over-adopt and then we find something hasn't worked very well because the patient is the person paying the price here. Do you think that some advances, for example, you talked about uh, minimal access mitral, but things like TAVI are actually, in a way, reducing the development of um, a, an alternative uh, biomaterial because there's this now vogue towards putting in a, an aortic, a biological valve earlier because, in fact, you know you can have a redo procedure and have it done minimally invasively. So why not? Why, and why worry about anticoagulation? And each time you reduce the EOA, the, the mm -hmm. effective orifice yeah. area diminishes. And below a 23, is a TAVI really a good idea? You're going to give the patient a gradient. You're already going to give them a gradient by giving them a, a smaller biological valve. And when you put a valve in valve, maybe valve in valve in valve, we don't really know how long the TAVI lasts. I'm not decrying TAVI, it's a great idea. But the gatekeepers, the cardiologists, have, have, have taken this to their heart, forgive the pun, and are running with it through femoral access because they're used to femoral access. But surely surgeons can take more ownership of that. There's, 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 there's the transcervical route, cutting across here and getting direct access to the aorta. People are working on that. Uh, Otto de Pont has done some good work in Austria on that. Uh, there's various other forms of TAVI we could have. They, they don't need to be made of pericardium. They could be made of a biomaterial, especially if the life of the device has to be curtailed or will be curtailed by the lifespan of the patient. But going down into 50-year-olds, 55-year-olds, we have the Partner 3 study running. We're going to see what's going to happen with that. I think um, TAVI has a very good place. It's not a panacea, and I think we will find that. You talked a bit about the regulatory environment. How do you find, clearly there are differences between the UK and even Europe, but also the US. And um, how do you find, do you find adoption is easier in the States than it is in Europe and the UK? Or do you find that there's not a huge difference between those? I, th I think we have, a, we have a bit of um, change in the environment over the last five years. Europe has come up a lot. We've had some problems that has forced, I think, in some respects, maybe even over-regulation. Maybe that's a controversial term. But after the PIP breast implant uh, disaster, if you can call it that, or it wasn't so much a regulatory compliance, just someone didn't do what they were meant to do. And people can always do that with a car or with anything. So. I think the regulatory environment has made it quite difficult to develop things, to test things. If you go back, here in the UK we used to have a lot of testing going on. We had people like Mr Ryan Eskew, we had, we, had, we had people like Donald Ross, we had, I don't I can name a hundred of them, Professor Bain, there's lots who did a lot of work. Now in the NHS it's extremely difficult because some of the NHS trusts have said, if you develop anything, we want to share. Yeah. And sometimes they're unrealistic. I, I've sat as a senior member in, in, in large corporations and NHS trust people show up and say, we want 50%. Really? How do we, how do we afford that? And, the, and they only see the end price. They don't see the huge amount of development work. I think perhaps there's too much focus on financial pressures in the UK. 
And, I mean, uh, I'm a taxpayer in the UK. I, I want the government to get value for money from anything they get. And, and competitive pricing is no problem. I would think in some other countries you're getting imposition of price, which we are seeing now in some countries. In some countries, the hospitals have been bought up by private corporations, thinking of Germany here, um, and they're imposing not talking to the surgeon, the person who uses the product, mm. and someone quite remote can often choose the product the surgeon may be faced with the next day when he or she is doing an operation and is unfamiliar with it. Mm. A little bit's happened in the NHS and it's happening elsewhere. Uh, but certainly in the United States, that, that's a familiar thing as well. And something that's been quite fundamental in the media lately is obviously the, the change in sort of political situation and, and Brexit, <laughs> for, to put it bluntly. Um, do you think that this is going to change the way in which device companies are going to be able to operate in the UK and in Europe? I think the UK in the past was, was a place you tested a lot of products, things were done and, and, and we, we have a very, one of the big advantages of the UK was you have everybody tracked through the social security system. So you can actually get very good demographics, very good patient details. But in a wider sense, as far as the, is, as the EU is concerned, I don't think it'll make a big difference in pricing. I think there'll be still a form of homogeneous uh, a market. Um, in some countries in Europe they had already drifted away a little bit from the CE mark being a universal key to get into the market because you had other things you had to comply with like getting a special number or get, and you only got that after application. So CE mark wasn't an automatic key. So I, and, and I think medics Surgeons in particular, cardiac surgeons certainly talk across all frontiers. And if it is one of the great benefits of working in cardiac surgery all my life, it's been that it's truly international. And people do help each other from any country to another country. And you often get experience working in Australia for a while, America, or working somewhere else. And I think that's been to the benefit of patients. What is more worrying is the fact that we've had legislation recently that's saying that some foreign times the way we used to support Congresses cannot be supported anymore. The way we used to support surgeons from socialised medicine systems to Congresses cannot be supported anymore because it's seen as being too close a relationship. And I think that's a pity. I wonder how discourse is going to take place in the future face to face. It may happen by video conferencing, it may happen certainly by email and by paper publishing, but for international congresses, I think the glory days are over. And to end on maybe a slightly more optimistic note, I think, can you tell us if for, for someone who's inspiring to be the next generation of um, uh, innovator, uh, of entrepreneur, of being able to bring a new device to market, what would you say are the key steps in taking a new innovation and making it practical and taking it from to the bedside to the, to the operating theatre? Well, I, I've been lucky enough to be tasked by the Scottish Government to do that. Um, and that's something I've been doing recently and, and holding talks and uh, trying to tell, give an idea of the steps. I have a lot of young men and women pouring out of university, good engineers, bioengineers, with good concepts. Sometimes you say it's been done before, you didn't read the literature, yeah. or uh, perhaps it's not viable as a commercial thing, which is a great pity. Uh, in the past, the companies I worked for, or the entrepreneurs I worked for, often did things that didn't make money, but they did it as a kind of service. The large corporations <coughs> are less likely to have their investors do that. And I'm trying to say to them, don't, don't just build something and then try and get an exit strategy in three, three years because uh, a VCT gave you the money. Um, try and build something bigger than that. Add on new products, bring in colleagues. Because I think 
there is new ground to be explored and the big corporations, yeah, they buy in, they don't let the small company take the risk because they have what we call DPS, deep pocket syndrome, and they will be heavily sued if something goes wrong. Small company can take more risks. But that can only happen in tandem with working with your profession. And we have to do that. And I hope in the future we're still allowed to do so because it's, there's only one person suffers if we don't cooperate at a very deep level. That's the patient. Absolutely. John McKenna, thank you so much for sharing your thank vast you, experience and insights with us. Thank, thank you. you.